So, Rob, how are you doing? Rob Vickerman, ex-England Sevens captain. I feel very honoured to be in your presence. Oh, stop it, mate. I am currently in Tokyo here covering the games. About two hours ago, we just saw Fiji be crowned double Olympic gold medalists. Uh, you can tell I'm in code Tokyo because I can touch both walls with my arms. So it's uh, a <laughs> bit of a tight one. But it's been interesting. Not your average games, not your usual games. Um, very much a different type of games. But either way, um, Fiji, amazing emotions at the back end of the tournament. They went through the mire. They haven't seen their families since January. That is their commitment. So it's been nice to January. see it all end with some gold. Yeah, mate, January, way back. So wait, so how has that worked then? What what have they been? They've been in like full quarantine since then, or did they left Fiji and that's it? Yeah, they've been in camp whilst in Fiji. Uh, then they went on a bit of an Oceania tour, so they went to Australia for a significant period. They played there for a bit. That was about eight weeks. Then they had a holding camp, and rather than risk going back to the islands, um, they decided to to stay out. So yeah, Gareth Baber, his wife was was on a Zoom call after the Olympic gold medal final. And she was saying, I haven't really seen him in, in eight months. It's like, oh God, that's some commitment. Jerry, wow. two, I, three, three little kids. You know, when you're talking about children who are one, three and five, I think that's a big old chunk of their life you've missed. So that that's the level of commitment that these guys have. And ultimately it's come to fruition because they were pretty amazing in the final. So t tell me a little bit just quickly about, about the, the Olympics experience for you you like how has that gone because you you you've been in quarantine for a little bit and then how do you how do you work over there you see you just go back and forth from hotel. It, it's kind of a different olympic experience right oh my god yeah i mean i was looking to get to rio 2016 with the bbc which was pretty special um this one i mean massively different as soon as you got off the plane you realized very quickly it was different in fact preceding that i had to do five tests before i came out and isolate myself at home um not go anywhere public so it was pretty severe uh, kind of knew loosely what was coming into in terms of the testing protocols, but the actual Im implementation of, of those um, restrictions have been pretty tough. So you get off the plane, you're tested, you're then in a holding pen for an hour at the airport. I sailed through some of the crew, I think they were six and a half hours, seven hours in the airport waiting for their tests. And then your first three days in Tokyo, you're not allowed out your room other than to go to the IBC, the International Broadcasting Centre, where you have to get your uniform, meet a few people, get a schedule fixed. And then after those three days, you are then on what's known as hard quarantine. So for 14 days, all we can do as broadcasters is go from the IBC to the hotel, to the stadium. No walking down the street. One shop you're allowed to go to, which is a designated shop just around the corner. Um, and it's pretty, pretty strict with these daily checks and yeah, and it's the same for the athletes. The athletes basically have the same protocols within that, but they're not even allowed to go into a shop. So I've been asked to get toothpaste and stuff from some of the players to try and send it to them and throw it to them on the pitch. And they have to be out of Tokyo within 48 hours. So this game's experience for them is really bizarre. You know, bearing in mind how much they commit to it. For me, this is a hotel room. It's not much different to usual, I guess. So how does that then, you know, you... You obviously, you know, so much experience playing and and these kind of competitions. How how does that play into the actual like the performance? Like thinking about like the USA, obviously disappointing to to finish sixth. Plus a yeah, a very strange sort of experience. Do you, it, how will they leave these these teams leave? Especially if you didn't get a medal, will they leave like quite deflated? You think? Yeah, absolutely. You know, just in terms of the US team specifically, you know, they're a team who have eight players, 30 and over. Sevens is a young man's game. Everybody kind of knows that. It's not just the fitness thing, but the lifestyle factor as well. You know, doing it with families is, is a very difficult thing to do. So the US boys probably doesn't suit them as much. Very diverse group of people, very charismatic, very buoyant personalities. So to really coop them up, it can be difficult for them to adjust. Whereas someone like GB, for example, who have only been together for six months, this was grade A time for them. They got to know each other. They got to understand each other a bit more. They, you know, they, they certainly grew as a team in their time here. Um, and that's how it can work differently. Fiji, you never really know with Fiji that, you know, they probably quite like each other's time. But the fact that that's not just a three week experience for them, it's a six to eight month experience for them. I imagine the relief on many of these players minds now is 
is phenomenal. Like it's a quite a a good thing to have done, to have experienced, but to be over. I mean, the big question for the US team specifically is what's next? You know, these guys who are said are aging between 30 and, and 35. Where are you going to go? What, what are you going to do? I mean, you can't just start thinking about the next cycle. It's, it's a four-year program now. So there's some big questions hanging over these USA players. I suppose the good thing is only three years until the next Olympics, right? <laughs> so, yeah, good point. That's a good point. It's maybe the 30-year-olds can, can hang on. They might get there. Um, so do you think that's interesting you're saying about like the flamboyant of the flamboyancy of like the, the US team? Do you think because the Colin Isles and Perry Baker had, had relatively at tournaments? Um, I mean, I know in the last couple of games they they got a few a few meat pies, but do you think that has played into just the general performance um, that that they've not been you know able to express themselves as much? I do. I think that's definitely a factor for someone like Carlin. And you know, the world only has to look at his Instagram, where he's taking videos of himself sprinting up and down a track in the athletes' village. The guy needs to be exposed to crowds. He needs to have, you know, a certain amount of energy provided for him. Like he's a, an amazing rugby player and what he's become and certainly how much he's improved. But for him, no crowds doesn't work. Um, saw a bit of their build up when they came across to the UK where um, they're actually based near Birmingham, but he kept thinking they were in London, which is about two and a half hours away. But uh, he, he's someone that didn't respond well to that. Perry Baker, the same. Like, these types of, of situations for players who seek the big moment, who want to be the person to get the headline, to you know be the star of the show, it's a really hard adjustment. And I think we, certainly as a broadcasting team, we weren't talking about how eerie it was but in a 50,000 seat stadium with essentially 25 people in the crowds in the stand who were just admin staff. So yeah, for players like that, it makes a, makes a big, big difference. Especially when sevens, you're so used to like the party atmosphere, you know, and that's such a big part of it. It's, it's a shame. Um, so, so the, the the seven series, the HSBC seven series, starts in September. So I suppose they can bounce straight into into that. But there's going to be a lot of questions, right? I mean, this this sort of second Olympics that the, there's been probably some disappointment, um, probably a lot of big questions being asked. I wonder if Mike Friday is going to is he going to stay around? Is is he got other other projects? You know, do do you think he'll be he'll be around for the next Olympics with the US? Well, you're thinking if he were going to be around, it'd be something they would have already announced. You know, these are guys who are you know usually on two or three, perhaps even four year contracts with it being a cycle. I think the lure for Mike Friday will be the fact that the next Olympics is in Paris, a little bit closer for him in the UK, um, and I think. They're big questions to ask, you know, USA rugby, not in the greatest place. Um, I think Ross is trying to get a grip of things and Dan Payne, someone who's trying to help as well. So I think there's a lot of movement within the board and a lot of decisions to be made. But what USA rugby needs, what clearly needs to be put forward is this plan, is how they can use 15s and 7s as pathways. The MLR, one of the best products in rugby at the moment. I've been loving some of the content flying around on that and not just the LA Guiltinis because they get a lot of their time, although that is pretty good. Um, it's an exciting time and I think the USA need to capitalise on that because a lot of the people in the UK, Europe, Australia, New Zealand, they're seeing what's happening in the US and they want a part of it. For them, the barrier is the visa element to it all. But even, you know, these teams who are seeking to recruit players, there's teams who have finished this sevens campaign who maybe want to get into a, a 15s environment and and they want to play and, and some of those names are big names on the seven series so it'll be exciting times